Take your Bibles tonight, turn with me to the uh, Psalm 6. Psalm 6. This is another lamenting psalm of David. Uh, you know, we talked about the lamenting psalms. He, he's lamenting uh, here in this psalm. And let me read it, and then I'll go back. We'll, comp we'll, we'll, we'll make a few comments on it and, and get ready to go to the house. It's already been a good time. We've done heard Brother Mike and, uh, and pray, and Brother Don give us a, uh, a report. Man, uh, and, and good, just good time together. Amen. I tell you what, I need the Wednesday charge-up sessions. I don't know about you, but it's like a charge-up session to me. All right, Psalm 6, verse 1, O Lord, you hear the lament, Lament, uh, lamenting in David's voice. Rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chastise me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for, for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groanings. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all that mine enemies. Depart from me. All ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. As I read about this psalm and what some Bible scholars seem to think this why David wrote this psalm. Sometimes they're hard to determine why they wrote them. There was so much going on in David's life at so many different times that it's kind of hard to know where to put this psalm in David's life. But as I read the psalm and I, I hear about his groanings and how he's not only physically hurting but spiritually hurting, and he's talking about his enemies still. He's talking about... Um, you know, how he's made, the, he's, I make my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. He's been weeping. He's crying. He's, he, he, he's just in a state of disbelief. And, and so I seem to, I, I want to still put this and group this with the last two or three Psalms that David has talked about when you remember, go back to Psalm 3, when Absalom had, you know, um, basically evicted his dad from the kingdom and will take his kingdom from him. And he had some of his own advisors against him. He's lost some of his friends. And now people are out to kill him, and he's the king. And, and, I, and then I get to think about, he, he's thinking about his enemies. He's thinking about not only his enemies that are ones he thought were his enemies, but what about those he didn't expect to be his enemies? I've used the phrase before, I've been in, you know, when you stay in the ministry and been in the ministry, Brother John, is, understand what I'm saying, about to say here and understand what I'm about to say. When you stay in the ministry as long as I have, people shoot at you. And I use that, you know, as a, just as a figure of speech. They shoot at you. But the problem is sometimes you don't know where the, where the shots are coming from. You know you're being shot at, but you just don't know where they, where, where they are and who, who they are. And so this is where David is. David is he said, they're against me. I don't know who they are. I don't know where they are. And, and, and then he's thinking, okay, I'm not thinking right. My mind's not right. And as a result of that, David's feeling guilty because he's doubting God. And so I, I've labeled this psalm a confident answer to an agonizing plea. A confident answer to an agonizing plea. He's asked God in the first verse there, he says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. He's, he, he's asking God to lighten up his chastening hand. 
Now, I don't know that David was really convinced. I think he was convinced that God was doing it. He may have not known why. Now, don't get me wrong. There were times in David's life David needed the chastening hand of the Lord, just like us. We need the chastening hand of the Lord. But sometimes we go through things and we wonder, okay, God, why? What did I do this time? How many have ever asked that question? I have. I said, what did I do this time? I know I'm bound to do something. What did I do? And I go back and think of Job. Job hadn't done anything, but yet he thought he, had, he thought he was, and his friends certainly were reminding him he did. So we, all of us have been there, and we sometimes, and I don't know about you, but I know I was raised up, you know, from the older generation, believing, okay, don't ever question God. It's a sin. Secondly, you know, you, you know when, when you're going through something bad, it's the chastening hand of the Lord. And I've learned in my life that's not necessarily true, neither one. That's not necessarily true. Just because you're going through something doesn't mean God's whipping you for something. That doesn't mean that. That just, that, you know, that may mean that, hey, the devil might have gone to the Lord and said, yeah, you got a hedge around that boy, that, that, that lady down there or that boy down there. And if you take that hedge out, did that to Job. If he did that to Job, he's going to do it to others. And, but David really thought that God was chastening him. Perhaps he was feeling guilty because he was questioning God. He was doubting God. Look, he was the king, chased out by his own son. Now they're trying to kill him. Wouldn't you feel that everybody was against you? You didn't. Who could you trust? You ever got to the point in your life, who do you trust? Who can I trust? And so he's, he said, rebuke me, you know, not in thine anger. And, um, and then we learn that the chasing hand of the Lord is this. God's not whipping us in anger or in displeasure. And David, I don't believe, really believes that. I believe what, what David's talking about. And remember this. this. Here's something we have to understand when we're reading the Old Testament. And this is something I've pointed out before. People like David and Abraham and the Job and these other guys we read about in the Old Testament, the best they had of the understanding of God was a shadowy understanding. That's how I refer to it. It's a shadowy understanding of God. Now, simply what I mean by that, they believed God, don't get me wrong, but they didn't have what you and I have. We've got the completed written Word of God. We've got Jesus to look back on. And then you got people say, well, you know, those Old Testament saints look forward to Jesus like we look back to Jesus. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. The only thing they knew is that God promised them a Messiah. That's all they knew. But they didn't know anything other than what the Scripture said about that Messiah. They didn't know. We can go back and read about Jesus himself talking to us in the New Testament. They didn't have that pleasure. They didn't have that enlightenment. And simply what I mean, you know, what I mean by that, if we go over to go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, I want to show you something. So the Old Testament, and you've heard me say it this way, what's in the old concealed is in the new revealed. Okay? The Old Testament, there's a lot of types. The, and, and, you know, of what things are antitypes in the New Testament. You've got a lot of shadows in the Old Testament that are fulfillments and pictures of in the New Testament. So you only got shadows in the Old Testament. Se go over to 2 Timothy and, chat and look at chapter number 2, <clears throat> chapter 2, and look with me in verse number 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now he's talking about Christ and the salvation. Now they didn't understand salvation in the Old Testament like you and I do. Now they got saved by grace just like we do. But it's like Abraham, for example. He was told to offer his son Isaac. And you go to Hebrews, you learn that Abraham's works was accounted to him for what? Righteousness. We, because he believed God. And he trusted that belief and acted upon that belief. 
And that's where we go. We learn that, look, believing is not enough. you got to act upon that belief. you got to, you know, you know, I could believe all day long that a chair is going to hold me up. I can sit there and analyze that chair, do an in-depth study of how thick the steel is. I can listen to the engineers of how much they put a weight limit on that thing, and I'm way under that. And I can sit there and say, oh, look, I can see people sit in that chair. If it'll hold them, it'll hold me. I can sit there and analyze it till the cows come to the house, as the old person says, right? But until I sit down, I ain't proved anything, have I? I can sit there and tell God, I can sit there and explain, oh, God's going to do this, and God can do this, and God, but, but until we actually trust him and let him do it, then we haven't done anything. So, so you know, the Old Testament people, the, the saints of the Old Testament, they didn't have the pleasures that you and I have in, the, in, in being in the days of grace and having the New Testament at our disposal. And, and so that's one thing to keep in mind. They don't have a full understanding. They have what they know, and that's it. And uh, my soul is, verse 3, so vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. But watch the turn. Now, I'm, re I'm, I'm jumping down here. I want you to see the turn that David makes. The reason I say a confident answer to an agonizing plea. He starts out agonizing, okay? I'm weary, verse 6. He says, I'm weary with my groanings all night. Make I my bed to swim. How many of you have cried to the point that you just, your eyes are red, they're hurting, that you can't cry anymore? You, you, I mean, you're just vexed as the word is used, right? I water my couch with tears. Don't you love the poetic imagery here? Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. He mentions his enemies again. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord. You see the turn? Sort of a subtle turn, wasn't it? But it was a turn, wasn't it? He says, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Why? Because the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. What does the New Testament teach us about that? We know if we pray according to his will, we know that he what? Heareth us. David says, he heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. In other words, not only has he heard me, but he's heard my prayer. He's heard what I said. He knows how I feel. And then he says, and the Lord will receive my prayer. You, I've learned you have to grow in prayer. I've, learned, I've grown I've learned you had to grow in prayer. I've learned that, you know, I used to, th when I first started out being a Christian and I, and, and, and trying to, quote, live the Christian life, I'd always heard, saw by example and learned by example, okay, prayer is this thing you go to and ask God for all these things. Right? God, I need this. God, I need this. God, I need this. God, would you please do this? And you, That genie. Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I want this, I want this. Lord, would you do this? And that's how many Christians, you know, think of prayer. You bring a long list of laundry to the Lord and ask him for everything in the book. We're missing the boat in the prayer. We're missing it. I mean, I just now learn I'd go to God and just sit there for a while. Because sometimes I don't, I've learned now i got a lot less to say than I used to. Because, Lord, you bless me beyond measure. If you don't ever give me anything else, I don't deserve what you've done. So I'm not going to sit here and ask for anything else. And I just sit there and I contemplate what he's done for me. And say how good you are, how good you've been to me. And I don't deserve it. Don't we have the model prayer, our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? That's not the Lord's prayer. That's the model prayer. Because it follows the question that disciples ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. He says, when you pray, you pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. You want to go to John, the Lord's prayer, you go to John and go to the Garden of Gethsemane. I, that's what I consider the Lord's prayer. And you know, it's kind of interesting. He asked the Lord about removing the cup from him, but then he, what did he do? Turn his prayer to his disciples and prayed for them. 
didn't he? And then I've learned to pray for other people and intercede on their behalf. In other words, tears are liquid prayers to God. No words, just tears. Over a parent, over a child, over a dear friend on a deathbed, or maybe a situation. All I have, Lord, is the tears because I don't know what to say. And I'm thankful, and this is something the Old Testament saints knew nothing about, but I'm thankful that we have the Holy Spirit that the Bible tells us that intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. When we're sitting there crying and our heart full of tears are going to the God, God in liquid words and prayers, the Holy Spirit's interceding on our behalf all that time, doing for us what we know we need, what we need, and we don't have a clue what it is. Because I've learned this too. Most of the time we don't know what's good for us. And I've also learned that we learn from the very thing that's going to help us the most. I've seen it happen many times. I've done it myself. And we run from the very one thing that will help us the most. And people say, I just can't. No, you can. And somebody's got to tell you the hard things. Yes, you need to get, you need to do it. And I know it's going to be tough. I know it's going to be tough. David knew it was tough. But you hear the confidence. Verse 10, let all my enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. So a confident answer to an agonizing plea. David was confident. You notice something in these lamenting psalms, the three now that we've looked at? You notice that David pleads and has some agonizing thing going on, but then he always has a confident thing about God and trusts God. Well, we have a lot to learn from people like that. Remember, they understood a lot less than what we understood or should understand, and we ought to be able to trust God a whole lot more because we have a whole lot more that has been written for us than they did. We have the cross. And there was a lot said in the New Testament about Jesus and the cross. And if God, and this is one thing about Calvinism, that I can't get past this one simple thing. If God loved me, or even one person so much, that he was willing to send himself the best heaven had to earth to take on flesh to die, then why wouldn't he save everybody if they come to him? Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to be saved because I know better. But I'm just saying God will save anybody that comes to him. Because God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And we got family members. And folks, listen, this is one thing that's plagued my mind here recently. I really think and believe, as Paul penned the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you'll notice the words that he pen, penned in those words, for the Lord himself shall descend with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we, which are alive and remain. Paul really thought, and he really believed, that Jesus was coming in his lifetime. He really believed it. And folks, we're a lot of years past Paul. And if it was that close with Paul, how close do you think it is for us? I really think that Gabriel's pursing his lips up, wetting his lips, getting ready to blow that trumpet. I believe we're close. 
and those people that you want to tell, should have tell, want to tell, going to tell, and you hadn't told, what are you going to do when the rapture comes and you're gone? And the first thing going to come to your mind, your mind, when you stand before Jesus, is going to be, I did not tell the one that I loved the most. I put it off. I put it off. I put it off. I put it off. And now I can't do it. And I'm going to end right there. And remember Wednesday night, I mean Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we we're going to meet right out here. And the uh, plan is if we have a good, the, good, the good crowd that I think we're going to have passing out these John and Romans, is that we'll just get on the bus, one of those of us can, and might go some cars, some that can, and I'll just take some folks off and drop them off and some places and, and then uh, go pass out some, come back and get folks. How about that? Okay? And uh, we'll do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, again for such a sweet service tonight. Lord, those that are here. And, Lord, you just fill our cup, Lord. There's a song that I sing, you know, my cup overfloweth. My, my, because my, my saucer overfloweth because my cup runneth over. And, Father, I pray that as we just think about your word and think about what you've done for us as we go out and meditate on it day and night, that, Lord, we'll remember what you've done, remember what you've told us, and go out and be faithful and diligent in doing it. I pray that, Lord, you'll just give fruit for the labor that's put forth and bless the efforts that are put forth. And, uh, and Father, I pray you just be with those that are sick, and, Lord, not only physically but spiritually as well. And I pray that, Lord, you'll bring us back our next appointed time. For we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. There we go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, peppermint. Oh, peppermint. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that stings just a little bit. That stings just a little bit. Oh, I got it. This is what I was thinking of. That's what I was thinking of. Like, this isn't so bad. Oh. Hey, it's Saturday morning. It's about 10.30, so welcome. This is Sticky. This is Sydney. My name's David. Um, we're doing something a little bit special this morning. Uh, I, unless you've been living under a rock, you will know that Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of England, Australia, Canada, South Africa, and a lot of other places too passed away over the weekend. We're going to be making some little lollies in honour of that. They're not for sale. What we're going to do, just as a gesture of sort of uh, solidarity with our friends in England, we're going to make little lollies that say Liz, with a little crown on her head, we're going to pack them up in little bags. And if you order from England or the UK this week, we're going to stick a little bag of free Lizzie lollies in your candy for you. Uh, I'm going to do this. And I don't think I've sung this song in a million years since I was at school, but... God save our gracious Queen. Long live our noble Queen. God save the Queen. Send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us, God save our Queen. Now I make no secret of the fact that I am not a monarchist and I don't think Australia should be a monarchy, but Liz did live a life of service and did it with grace and dignity. So thanks Liz. R.I.P. baby. Let's go. Lizzie Lollies. R.I.P. baby. My name's Dave. This is Ian.